Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Patient Convert podcast. Got your co-host, Justin Knott, here, and really excited to have a guest, Dr. Andrew Tisser, joining. He has got a really, really successful podcast that he'll talk to you about, as well as he's an expert in kind of physician happiness, to be honest, is, is getting physicians to be able to start building a career that doesn't overwhelm them, that, that doesn't get burned out. So, Dr. Tisser, I'm really excited about having you on. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about the podcast as well. I know you have a really large audience and thanks for joining us. Yeah, Justin, thanks for having me and thanks for those kind words. Yeah, so my name is Andrew Tisser. I'm an emergency medicine specialist uh, working in the Western New York area. I have a podcast, as you said, it is called Talk to Me Doc. That's Talk the Number Two, Me DOC. Initially, the podcast was born to talk about communication within the healthcare team, uh, which was an interest of mine, and then pivoted over time as my interests really uh, became focused on the early career physician, uh, which I arbitrarily called like up to seven years out of training because physicians early in their career nowadays uh, have a lot of other issues that are unrelated, uh, well, not unrelated, but are different than our predecessors. And we see a lot of people talking about burnout and unhappiness in the 40, 50, 60 year old docs, but we don't really talk about it when you're first out of training and you're 30 and you have, you know, half a million dollars of debt, et cetera. The other big thing I do is uh, what I call career strategy. It's basically a, a mixture of career coaching and consulting for early career physicians to help them design careers that they're actually happy with um, and brings them fulfillment. And why do you think, because you talk about like when they address physician burnout and those terms, like you said, it's a lot of kind of the later stage career guys and gals, but it seems to me, I mean, because it's even say non-physicians that just come out of college, I think there's also a huge misconception of like, you're going to have a workload, like the people in their fifties, like making money and, and it's just not really the case. You're going to be doing a lot of grunt work and things you don't like. Why do you think in the physician side, is it a misconception, a misunderstanding, wrong frame of mind when they're coming out of like med school and residency that it, they just land in the middle of something that's kind of overwhelming or can cause depression? What do you think is the thing that's causing that? Yeah, I, mean, I guess that's a bit of a loaded question, right? There's a lot of factors that have changed and shifted the burnout to the younger docs. I think a lot of the issues that were burning out the older docs are starting to burn out the younger docs, right? So we talk about some of the issues with the older docs being the electronic medical record and adapting to that, adapting to insurance needs, adapting to decreased compensation by insurance companies, et cetera. We're coming out right into that, right? And so I think the electronic medical record is one thing. We grew up with it. That's fine. I don't think that's a big issue for us. But all the other issues that are affecting, you know, increased hours, decreased pay, increased demands on time, Uh, you know, administrative hurdles, et cetera, those are only getting worse. And that's why they're burning out the older generation. I think the other big issue is, is that you're supposed to not be unhappy when you get out of training, right? So you're supposed to go through med school is tough. And then residency is like really hard. And then you get out and it's supposed to be like, okay, now you're make you've made it, you make the big bucks and you know, you're hanging out at on your boat or whatever this crazy misconception is. But in fact, what we're seeing is you get through all that, you come out with uh, greater than mortgage sized loan payments, you get out with decreasing compensation, you get out with a general distrust by the public of physicians these days for, you know, that's a whole different topic and all these other issues, but you're supposed to just be like, well, you're too young, right? Like you're too early in your career to be burnt out that burnout comes like 20 years from now. And that that's absurd. Yeah. Yeah. Then where is the, and I know this is obviously kind of even what you do as a career to help physicians, but where does the hope lie in there? Is it like just knowing that the first couple of years is going to be tough or is it just coming at it with kind of a strategy like you help build? Like where is the hope lie? Because it is kind of a mess and you're going to get hit with it right away when you get out. And so how do you kind of start dealing with that? You know, it's tough to say. I don't think it's going to get better anytime soon, personally, right? I don't think that it's like, well, grin and bear it for like five years, 10 years, and then all of a sudden it'll be awesome. You know, I don't think that's where modern medicine is heading. I think there's a lot of good uh, coming from people talking about these issues nowadays, but that's going to be slow. And and I think, you know, my whole point is that you need to create a career that you like. Yep. It's not just going to be handed to you. You know, if someone 
came out of school and came out of residency and they were given this like amazing nine to five, no call, no weekends, million dollars a year job. I mean, that's awesome, but that's not reality. And in my opinion, it doesn't really build like resilience. It doesn't build like the ability to strategize to get out of other bad situations. So where the hope lies, I think, is in each individual physician. And this isn't only physicians now. I see the same things with nurses. I see the same things with advanced practice providers, such as nurse practitioners and PAs, who I work work with occasionally as well. Modern medicine is a bit of a mess. And it's really up to the individual to create a career that they love that they deserve, that is satisfying for them. And that looks like a lot of different things for different people. Now that may look like do you know completely leaving medicine and doing a non-clinical career. That's fine. That may look like doing part-time medicine, doing uh, side gig, side hustle, side businesses. That's great too. That may look like a shift to administrative work. That may look like normal doctor work, but doing advocacy on the side. You know, it really depends on what makes you fulfilled and what makes you happy. And I think the younger generation as a whole is rallying against this, like, you got to be in the hospital 85 hours a week and never see your children because that's what good doctors do. Like, that's garbage. That's a, that's really interesting. Now, would you say, because proactiveness seems to be absolutely critical with what you're saying. I mean, you've got to go out and set your own course because in five years or 10 years or 15 years, it may just honestly get tougher than it even is today. And so being proactive, I think what's interesting too, because I've seen this and I'm sure it was even more common back in the day because there was a, a lighter load. I mean, obviously being a physician is one of the toughest jobs, most demanding jobs, but there is still an ability to almost just go in it for the money kind of thing. And for, say, the people listening that are looking to become an MD, do you think it's more critical than ever to make sure that you have like a true inherent passion that is kind of underlining and driving it? Because I feel like I've even seen people like say, go just right into pain management because there's money in it or something like that. <laughs> Let's take a little divergence here and talk about money for five minutes. I think medicine is not the career to go into if you want to make money. And then you look at the general public, right? And you look at doctors and their vision of doctors and we all drive Lamborghinis and we all got yachts, right? But the truth of the matter is if you're a high school student, a college student considering a career in medicine, medicine is currently a mess. But Yes, you have to have a passion for it. You have to, and it's not just, I want to help people. Every med, incoming med student says they want to help people, but there's so many ways you can help people, right? That don't involve uh, eight to 10 years of your, of your life, right? Yeah. So the thing of it is, so you look at docs, right? Top 5% of earners across specialties in the country. No one is going to deny that we are well paid for what we do. And I'm not going to come back and say we're not, and we're, we're hurting and we're so like, poor. That's an absurd statement as well, right? But you also have to look at a opportunity cost. So you're going to medical school for four years, you're doing a three to seven year residency. After that, during med school, you're taking out loans to live during residency, you're getting paid 40 to $60,000 a year for working 80 to 120 hours a month. So if you look at how much of those people are actually getting paid is a couple of dollars an hour with two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt. And then you get out and you make $150,000, dollars $300,000 a year. A, look at your tax bracket. B, look at your loan repayment, where some people are paying three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month to pay that back. And then look at your take-home pay, right? So you're not, you're not going to be one of these like TV rich doctors when you get out. Yes, you will be well paid. No, you're not going to be struggling to survive and no one's saying that, but it is certainly not a, a get rich profession anymore. If you want to make money, there's a lot of easier ways to make money. Yeah, that's that's a- absolutely true. And then even money aside, the the trade-off with like the family life, the work life balance, like all the stuff especially early on that you're going to have to make a, a sacrifice for. Like if you start a family, you're probably not going to be able to spend a whole lot of time with them for a while and there's like all of that other stuff that's just complete money aside in terms of consideration too that is tough on a lot of people. Well, yeah, I mean it's tough on anyone, right? And then it's not just in training like it's depending on your specialty, that might be your life. You might be taking 24-hour call every third night for the rest of your career, depending on your specialty, right? So you got to think about, A, if you're okay with that, B, if that's what you really want, and C, if you're going into medicine for the right reasons, or, you know, just because you're good at science 
and it's a great job, which it is. No, you know, it, it is a great job. And I love being a doctor. Don't get me wrong. I don't want this to come off the wrong way. But I just want people to understand that going into this for money is a very flawed paradigm. Like, yes, money aside, but there's so many other things, right? Look at all the like 10 years of retirement savings that you don't have, right? I mean, it's just like, there's so many things. But yes, you're going to lose time. You're going to miss weddings. You're going to miss birthdays. You're not going to have time with your family when you're in school and in training. And when then you get out, I mean, who knows? I work two weekends a month, right? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. So with that, how do you kind of start that switch? You you mentioned it a couple of times. Like obviously there's d- several different avenues to go. Like is it getting out of full-time medicine? Is it starting a side gig? How do you kind of, the entrepreneurial side obviously is a huge interest of mine, but in the physician world, how do you kind of start switching to more of an entrepreneurial mindset? Even if you're say a hospital employee that feels like, like I'm a W-2, I get a paycheck, I don't own a practice or anything, but there's things that you can do to start thinking more kind of entrepreneurial and internal in terms of building your own career and all of that stuff. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I want to say just entrepreneurial entrepreneurship rather is not for everybody. And some people don't want to do that ever. And that doesn't mean that they have to like suffer and that the entrepreneurship is the only way to get out of this like prison that they're in, right? That's certainly an avenue for many. And some people really like it. I love it. You know, that's why we're here talking, right? But I think for many, it's really the first step to anything, you know, is realizing you're miserable. Like some people don't realize that, you know, (laughs) like some people just, and, and, you know, when you talk about career, what's so interesting about career is that it's not just career because it's everything. It's personal life. It's everything. Because if you're miserable at work, you're going to come home and be cranky. And maybe you don't want to hang out with the kids because you're in a terrible mood because you've been at work for 80 hours or whatever. So it's not just career. And people that say they can fully separate the career and their life are lying. Yeah, would not agree more. And and having been 10 years into starting a business, it, you always hear the like, it's not personal, it's work. And I started a business with my now wife, but that is so true. Like when you're really miserable at work, you're it's naturally gonna, gonna come through at home. And that's 100%, I couldn't agree more. That all, it all flows together and you can't separate it. Even though people say that they, you can, it's not possible. Absolutely. So I think realizing you're miserable is number one. And some people, it's very obvious. They're crying in their car before they go into work every morning, right? That's an extreme. But that, that happens. I've had clients that way. But some of them, it's just like realizing that they're just, they're unhappy at home. Where is that coming from? Okay. So you realize you're miserable. The way I work with people is step one is figuring out like your why for everything, right? And it's not like this hokey, like we need to get involved with our core values and understand who we are as a person because like that's amazing for the universe. But I think you need to know like what makes you tick, what you care about in order to design a career because otherwise, how are you gonna figure out what you like and don't like if you don't know like what makes you tick, right? And that's as, that's as hokey as I get, but that's step one. Yeah, and that, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, you still have to know kind of what you want out of it from a grander picture. Like, do you want a lifestyle business in medicine and that may require you to leave it ultimately, or do you want to, to do something else? But yeah, I mean, it, yeah, like you said, I mean, that, that as far as hokey, it, it does have to start there though. I mean, you've got to think of the grander picture of where do I want this thing to end up at some point? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so I, I break down my process is, is big categories of why, what, and how, right? So why is the first part figuring out who you are, what you, and why you do what you do before you can figure out exactly what you're going to do, right? Because people are like, I need out of medicine. I will do literally anything as long as my paycheck is X. And it's like, okay, but then you'll be miserable doing X, right? So step one is figuring out the why. And step two is the what. And the what is the, is the hard part, right? Because you really got to look down and figure out what do you hate about your current position? Maybe it just means going to the hospital down the road, right? And you'll be happy. That's that could be, you know, and, and I've seen that. And so the what we spend a lot of time figuring out kind of this blueprint as to like what you care about, what's important to you in a career, and then looking at minimums and ideals, right? So minimums are what are your deal breakers for your career? Right. So like it could be I need to be home at six PM every day. And if I'm not home at six PM any any day, no matter what I'm doing, I won't be happy. Okay, well, that's extremely helpful, yeah. right? Whatever it is. So you got to work through different areas of your career and what the deal breakers are be. And then there's ideals, right? You know, like 
you figure out what your ideal commute is, what your ideal pay is, et cetera. And you hope to get there, but maybe you won't get there. But as long as you don't have your deal breakers, you're going to be a lot happier than you are now. And then after that's all kind of completed, we have a picture of what you want to do. And maybe, again, maybe that's starting a business. Maybe that's being able to start something on the side to work into that slowly over time will create income to allow you to cut down at work. A lot of my clients want to do that and are successful at doing that. And then they're able to drop to part-time and then they're, and then they're a lot happier because they don't hate being a doctor. They just hate their current like life environment. Right. And that's the key. A lot of these people are amazing doctors and are great at patient care and they'd be so good if they just didn't work as much. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. You, you mentioned, obviously, we were talking about a little bit about entrepreneurship, but that's not a fit for everyone that is a physician that's out there listening and maybe unhappy with where they're at. But whether you're going to become a physician entrepreneur or you just want to get a better work-life balance, whatever it is, there's a personal brand aspect that I think is really important. And obviously, you've done an incredible job of building a personal brand. And we talk a lot about it through content because I think there's a natural legacy, a want to build obviously a legacy and an impact if you're going to become a physician. Talk to me a little bit about kind of how you've been so successful building your personal brand and kind of getting started there, but why a physician kind of regardless of where they're sitting, if they're starting a company or they're a hospital employee should be investing in some personal brand building. Yeah, I've talked about this a, a bit on my podcast as well with some of the kind of some of the big people in the space. And I think branding is important no matter what, because let's face it, right? Dem- depending on what you are, let's say you work in a clinic, in a multi-specialty clinic, and you're not the owner, you're just a salary person, right? And if I, we have a baby now, we just had a baby two months ago. So if we, had, we're looking for a, pe- thank you, we're looking for a pediatrician, we're going to Google it, right? You know, you're going to look things up on Facebook. You're going to look at reviews. You're going to talk to people, et cetera. Now, they're not not where I live, but I know when we were in Chicago, there was one um, pediatric practice that did these online videos, which is like simple, like helpful things for pediatric cases. You know, this is what you need to know about cold season, et cetera, whatever. And they had a, like a nice YouTube channel and they put out these videos every week. They're really helpful. Now, you going to go to that person or you're going to go to like no name, like sign down the street who just decided to hang a shingle and wait for their patients. You know, the way of the past of just graduating from training and buy, you know, leasing some space and hanging a shingle and waiting for patients to come to you is gone. So for that kind of doctor, branding is important. And if you're the person who's employed making those videos for your practice and, uh, you know, things get hard and they got to lay someone off, you think they're going to fire you? Are they going to fire the guy who isn't doing all those videos, right? Or it's, it's part of making yourself indispensable, even though that's kind of a hard thing to do these days. When, if you're bringing in money to the practice, if you're getting them more patients, if you're using your talents as a thought leader in a good way, you know, not going out there talking craziness, then uh, you're going to be more valuable to your practice. Maybe that means promotions. Maybe that means bonuses. Who knows, right? For the hospital employee, same kind of thing. You know, I've done interviews for my hospital in the past, talking to the community about different topics and uh, people are like, well, you know, they don't pay you for that. It's like, yeah, but it makes me look really good for the powers that be. Right. So I think everyone has a brand, no matter if they're, uh, they're entrepreneurial or they're just an employed doc, everybody has a brand. What you decide to do with it is your own choice. Well, first off, congrats on the baby. We, we have a five and a half month old, so I'm a little ahead. <laughs> Congratulations. Of I can vividly remember the eight week mark. It's, it's a dark time. <laughs> well, that's why I had to ask if we were doing video today, cause you don't want to see me. <laughs> oh man. I remember that. Like, is this ever going to end? I got 15 minutes of sleep last night. Oh man. But congratulations. It does get better. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's awesome. It, it's, yeah, it's, and amazing. It is. It, it's amazing. And I, I couldn't agree more on the brand side. I think it's been a really interesting narrative too, like what you just brought up and something, especially if you're, in med school or coming out of uh, residency or fellowship or in that kind of seven year window, like you talked about, it's becoming more and more critical because a lot of these, like say in the private practice world, for instance, you've got a lot of what I call kind of the gray hairs, like the ones that are 20, 30 years into their career. And they may have a book of business, so to speak, in terms of a healthy referral ecosystem. They're booked out three months in advance. And when you come in and you become a partner, except for some trickle down, like they don't want to deal with or it's something they don't want to do. They're not most of the time very invested in building out your book of business. And we see it all the time, like 
individual physicians like, I just joined this ortho practice, I've got my own location, and I've tried to convince the other eight partners to do marketing and they're not interested because they're so busy. And so I want to build my own website, my own brand, and figure out how I can bring in my own patients. It's like that's an unfortunate reality for a lot of people and why it's really important to invest in your personal brand. Couldn't have said it better. I agree. Yeah. And I mean, that's, and I, I just think doors, I mean, which I'm sure you would agree with, I, I think as you begin to invest the time and effort into building out your own space, and that can look so different. It can look like the journey you are where you're really building a business around it, or just you want to be a thought leader and whatever subspecialty you focus on. Doors just magically and naturally, it's not magically, but naturally start to open as you invest more and more in your brand. Because I think physicians have a huge leg up on a lot of other people that are trying to build personal brands because what they're saying is incredibly impactful, obviously, in terms of health and wellness. Yeah, I agree. And it's also, you know, I've said it before, it's the most marketable degree that there is, right? No matter what you want to do, you can do it with this degree, whether it's in the health sector or not, because we're just generally thought of as like thought leaders, et cetera. So agreed. What would you say to, because there, I think there's still this natural like frame of mind, like I just don't have the time. Like that's not going to happen. There's no way. We talk a lot about kind of like, well, then choose your medium or choose your path of least resistance. But what do you say to those people that are like, well, I can't do something like what Andrew has done. That's just way too much of a time commitment for me. What do you say to them? Well, then I guess it's not important to you, right? I mean, it's at the end of the day, there's there's time that you are doing nothing, right? There's certainly, I had a client who, um, who said this all the time. And I was like, what time you get up? And he told me like really early and what time you go to sleep really. I was like, what do you do during those times? He's like, Oh, I play video games. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. All right, man. (laughs) (laughs) Priorities. Bingo. And you know, great. It's great for mental health, et cetera. Fine. But you can't come at me and say, you don't have time. You make time for what's important to you. And maybe you don't form a social media account on like 15 different platforms, right? And you're not on Clubhouse and you're not on the most, like the biggest fad, but doesn't mean you can't do something, right? And no one's saying you have to post 14 times a day on Instagram either, right? So like there's time, you know, and and then there's there's all the entrepreneurial hacks, right? There's scheduling posts, there's batching, there's all these different things. So I don't really buy that. What was your decision? And and we talk to this a lot is like, I always think you got to start somewhere and most people try to be a master of all and they end up being a master of none in terms of like choosing your platform or choosing your medium. Like it's like, well, I'm going to create video and I'm going to be huge on YouTube and Instagram and LinkedIn. What advice do you have? Kind of where did you, and obviously I know everyone's journey is different, but what did you kind of getting started and even today feel like is your sweet spot or what you enjoy doing the most or the platform you enjoy focusing on the most? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good point. I like personally, I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn the most for business related issues. I mean, I love networking. It's, it's kind of one of my skills. I I'm on Twitter just like for my, for fun, for myself, like not really so much for business, but uh, LinkedIn and Instagram are what I enjoy right now. I really don't like Facebook. (laughs) for numerous reasons, but that's where I am. And I don't do a lot of video. I just, I, I do mostly audio content and, and written and, and picture content. But uh, yeah, that's where, that's where I hang out. Where do you think, because you, you still hear this. I mean, we, we even, even talk about this, like physicians are still kind of active on Twitter. I mean, obviously you're in more of the beat in terms of your brand building. You're obviously in the B2B space in terms of connecting with other physicians uh, in your network. Where do you find that they're the most engaged and active on currently, at least for you? Well, I guess it depends on what you're looking for. I mean, there's certainly a big cohort on, you know, with hashtag med Twitter um, on the Twitter side. I mean, there's a lot of people on Facebook, but I feel like physicians tend to congregate in their physician specific Facebook groups. And there's some big ones out there that are just like the huge doctor groups that you kind of got to be a doctor to be a part of. And I see a lot in, you know, a lot of interaction in there. Even as early as like two years ago, there wasn't that much on LinkedIn. I think there's been a lot more docs branching out onto LinkedIn these days, which I think is great because it's an underutilized platform. I still think there's a lot of growth to be had on LinkedIn and YouTube, really. There's a lot of of docs putting out great content on YouTube and YouTube's, you know, as big as they get. So I I guess that's like, I just said kind of all of them, (laughs) but yeah, that's kind of, that's been my observation at least. Yeah, I think, I think YouTube is... I think even Google, even though it's Google owned, has, I think 
still been lagging in terms of like natural interface between Google search and like YouTube videos. Like obviously YouTube you hear all the time is the second biggest search engine. But if you're doing, I still think what's interesting is there's a whole entire like SEO and search ecosystem that is, I think, relatively untapped on YouTube, except for a couple like really competitive markets. But they're still not, I don't think, that well integrated between the two. Like if you do like a like getting earwax out of your ear search. Like you, you're not always going to see YouTube videos as often as I think you should inside of organic search, which will be interesting. I think that that's going to become even more and more important and gives even more and more of an opportunity for that to be a really huge medium in terms of visibility. I agree. I wish I used it more. I just don't do a lot of video content, which, you know, gets back to the, to the time thing. And certainly I could do more, but things have all taken a little bit of a backseat with the baby. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But again, I mean, I think it's really important to focus like on a medium of choice and you have through audio. I think there's been a big benefit. It's been interesting. We started our podcast in November of 2019. So about like three months before COVID and everything went, went like haywire. And so there was that like massive dip in audio listenership while the world went nuts. And then as everything settled in there's been this like huge boom back uh, the swing the other way have you seen that in terms of like the audio content that you developed over the journey of like COVID happening and then kind of where we are today there's supposedly this like 30 or 40 percent uptick in podcast listenership yeah I've seen that exactly really the only ones that were doing well were anything related to COVID at you know in the in the real the beginning you know March 2019 the 2020 rather the the big surge you know the uh, an episode I had about co like uh, had interviewed somebody about COVID and misconceptions was like huge but everything else was just you know doing terribly but everything seems to have rebounded at this point. Interesting, interesting. What about some advice on uh, now whether we're talking about it a little on if you are starting a podcast, building a podcast in terms of of marketing it. Uh, I'd love to, to hear your advice of what you found to kind of be successful in terms of building your audience, whatever that audience may be as a physician, if you're choosing to kind of go the route of building a podcast. Well, if you're podcasting, if you want a podcast for physicians, me and my good friend, Dr. Bradley Block, who's also a podcaster, Physician's Guide to Doctoring, that's a good one. Check it out. We've joked in the past that if you want to talk to physician audiences, don't because it's too small of an audience. It was too small of a niche and like we need every person we can get. <laughs> but the, the thing of it is, it's just so, there's so many podcasts now. There's so much out there. You really got to get your niche down. You got to talk to the people you want to talk to. And I had a much bigger audience when I was doing the communication bit because it applied to everyone in healthcare than I do now when I'm just talking to early career docs. But that's fine. You know, I, I expected that, that massive drop off. I don't think there's anything that's working better than others right now other than consistency, uh, which is kind of a lame thing to say. And people hear that all the time, like be consistent. It was like, yeah, but really that's the one thing that's working. And if I drop something off, you know, if I go to from through four episodes a month to three, I see a, a drop in listeners. You know, if I stop doing email marketing or stop doing something on social just as a test, I'll see a drop off. So, you know, I think consistency is really what's what what works the best. And then a lot of it is just people telling people, you know, if you have a show that has guests uh, like this one or like mine, the guests are crucial in, in promoting it as well. The, the one, you know, the guests that promote their content, in addition to my promotion efforts, I see much bigger numbers on than the ones that don't. And that just makes sense, right? Because you want to listen to your friend or whoever's that's on a podcast. So yeah, I don't have any like amazing magic bullet advice other than the lame old consistency and talk about things that people care about. I absolutely second that. And we've seen it through now a year and a half journey in podcasting. And some of it, again, was like COVID just made everything kind of weird. But now everything being a little more consistent in terms of a uh, somewhat return to normal day life. I could not agree with you more. That is by far what we've seen in terms of the growth of our podcast is consistency and guests. I mean, both of those two things have mirrored exactly what you mentioned. But funny enough, when you talked about like the oversaturation of podcasts and there's some ridiculous number, there's like a podcast for every other person um, in the United States or something crazy like that. But it's something statistically like 90% of them never make it past 10 episodes. And I think that's what gets the listenership is listeners want consistent content. And so like we release every Tuesday morning at 9am. And doing that, we started that at the end of last year. 
has exponentially grown the podcast more than anything else is literally just making sure that we have good quality content that's released consistently every single week. Yeah, I agree. You know, and you know, like sitting at putting out what number 70, I think pretty soon for myself, you know, at least I made it past 10. So I'm happy about that. (laughs) But, and that's, that really, I mean, if you can do that, if you're sitting there as like a physician, like starting a podcast or whatever it is, whatever content, it really boils down to that because even the video stuff, like we do a lot of video. My wife does even more than I do, but that's what separates us from 99% of everyone else is honestly, I mean, I think the quality of the content does too, but just really like dumbing it down from the standpoint of we just consistently make more content consistently than other people do. And that's, that's a really big thing because most people, it's just really hard to build any consistency. You get out of the gate and you fall right on your face eventually. Agreed. So wrapping up, obviously you've talked a lot about what you do for a living and how you help physicians. Tell us a little bit about physicians that are out there listening, how they can get engaged with you, read your content, listen to your podcast, all of that kind of good stuff. Yeah, thanks. So um, everything is housed at uh, my website, which is andrewtisserdo.com, T-I-S-S-E-R. So there you can find the podcast, uh, links to my social. I'm on ev- all the social networks, um, either as my name or talk to me doc, talk to number two, me doc. You can find me everywhere and link up with me there. The podcast again is called talk to me doc. And it's on every platform. And um, you know, I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody. Yeah. Make sure you get connected with him. I know he's got a free strategy call that's up on the website. We'll make sure that we've got all of Andrew's links to his podcast, to his website, to his social, everything in the show notes, uh, like we always do. So make sure that you go over there. We'll be sharing this all across social media over the coming weeks. And don't forget, we've got a webinar that's coming up. If you go to entropy.com slash webinars, uh, you can see the latest webinar. So we're really excited about that. We're talking about how to rank your treatments number one on Google search. And Andrew, thank you again, as I said at the beginning of the show, for, I know as a busy physician and now as a dad of an eight week old, uh, time is very limited. So thanks for coming on and talking to our guests. I know they're going to get a lot of value out of um, the things you had to say today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to today's latest episode of the Patient Convert Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and review on your favorite podcast platform. We are on Apple, iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and Spotify, or you can sign up to receive the latest episode via email. Just check it out on my agency website or my personal website. And if you are looking for more amazing healthcare marketing information or just to engage, check us out at entropy.com. And for any of my amazing physician liaisons out there interested in growing their physician referrals or learning the strategy strategies that it takes to build highly engaged physician referral networks. Check out my website, kellynot.com, where I have free webinars, free downloads, and of course, my online physician liaison training course, Physician Liaison University. And as always, I'm a huge believer in connecting, engaging, and supporting one another. And the best way we can do that is networking. And I always, always connect with you guys on social media. And one of my biggest social media platforms is LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me there on LinkedIn or Instagram or Twitter at Kelly Knott. And thank you guys again for listening to the Patient Convert Podcast with your host, Kelly Knott.